Um, our speaker tonight is Dr. Bob Barnett, and he's going to present Memoirs as History, Small Town Life in West Virginia in the 1950s. Mr. Dr. Barnett is a professor emeritus at Marshall University, where he taught sports history for 35 years. He has written numerous articles, reviews, and academic papers, and his work appears in such publications as Golden Seal, the West Virginia Encyclopedia, and the Journal of Sports History. His most recent publication is a memoir, Growing Up in the Last Small Town, a West Virginia memoir, uh, which was released in 2010, and he has copies of those here tonight. Dr. Barnett is currently working on a book on the history of sports in West Virginia. And, um, Joe Geiger and I, our director, got to talk to him about it, and it sounds like a very fascinating book. So, without further ado, Dr. Barnett. How many people came because they're interested in writing or working with memoirs or life stories? Whoa. How many people came because they're interested in using memoirs as maybe historical research? How many came for the free beer? <laughs> when I retired in 2008 from teaching sport history at Marshall University, I dreamed of becoming a writer. Now, I've written 300 articles, book reviews and other publications, but I wanted to write books I'm like a real writer. I wanted to be a real writer. So I started working on a memoir, and in April 2010, the memoir came out, Growing Up in the Last Small Town, a West Virginia memoir, which we do have for sale after I'm finished, uh, $15. If I die, and I'll sign them. If I die, they'll be worth $18. <laughs> it's, 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 an, it's an investment in the future. Uh, so the book came out. I did 34 events, you know, book signings, book clubs, uh, anywhere I could get three or four people together, I, I would do a talk. I was living the dream. And so, uh, when I picked up the Huntington Herald Dispatch, Monday, there was an article in there, West Virginia author to have seminar. I thought, huh, oh, I wonder who that is. <laughs> I read the article and it's me. <laughs> so I would like to thank West Virginia History and Archives for having me come to speak and for you coming so I can continue to live the dream. Uh, the, uh, I, I want to kind of start with the difference between writing history and writing memoirs. First of all, uh, I, I wrote history, I wrote sports history, which is, is a social history or a form of social history where you emphasize the relationship between, or the interrelationship between sports and society. Which, you know, the things that people do for sports and for recreation and the things they're interested in in terms of sports really tell you a lot about a culture. And so this is what we do in sport history. When you write sport history, you start with your conclusion, with, with what you've concluded from this, and then you sort of detail how you came to that conclusion the facts and the information, a little bit dry. When you write a memoir, it actually has to be interesting. So this was a whole different, a whole different game for me. Uh, you know, memoirs are sort of in that branch of, of personal histories. You know, biographies are the classic example. A, a memoir is not a biography. A biography is a life story. It's a full life story written by somebody else. And you know, one of the classic biographies that's come out recently was, <coughs> Biography on Jerry, Rat, Jerry West, written by Roland Lazarby. Now, this was a biography. Jerry West's life story written by somebody else. An autobiography, as you know, is somebody writes their own life story. And so West was so mad about the Lazarby biography that he wanted to write his own biography, which came out West by West. Uh, and so this was an autobiography. Uh, a memoir is neither. A memoir is a slice of life. It's not your whole life story. You, know, you don't start, I was born poor but honest, I'm dead, and so I'm writing this from my grave. A memoir is a, is, is a piece of your life in which you want to tell a story. And it's your story. And, this, and it's important, I think, to preserve your story and to write memoirs, for one, just for your family. Because now, my grandchildren not only will know how I met my wife, but they'll also know how my dad and mom met, how they grew up, and how my, my great great, or how my grandfather and grandmother uh, met, and how they raised their families in, in Fallensby, West Virginia. So, this is, is really kind of a history of our family, which I think is very important for families to have. Secondly, for historians, these are really wonderful to have because they're primary sources, and they'll tell you things in memoirs that's hard to dig out from like newspaper accounts 
and scores of games. Um, you know, if you're interested in doing anything on, on sports in Northern West Virginia in the 1950s, I've got four chapters on that. And I mean, a lot of intimate stories about what it was really like to be in the huddle in 1950 on a, on a bad football team, a losing team. Uh, so from that standpoint, you know, it's very helpful to have, to have memoirs. Uh, the uh, memoirs, when you write memoirs, I hate to say this, you have to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Duh. But the beginning, you need to capture your audience. So in the chapter that I wrote about school, in the beginning I wrote, I was every teacher's worst nightmare. And then go on to proceed to tell you how I was or why I was. The next piece you write is the middle part, which is there used to need to be conflict. It's always good to have conflict in a memoir. And the conflict was with my third grade teacher. My third grade teacher insisted on calling me Clarence, which is my first name, because she was a very formal lady. Well, I wasn't going to answer to Clarence. Nobody called me Clarence. So after a couple weeks, she started calling me Robert, which is my middle name. That wasn't my name. I didn't go by Robert. And so I didn't answer her. She thought I was either deaf or dumb, or both. And so at the end of the first six weeks, I got all U's for unsatisfactory. I, actually, I think I got an, an satisfactory in using my handkerchief properly, because you got grades for that, but anyway. Uh, so, my parents came in, and we finally compromised. My name was Bobby Barnett, and, she, and we compromised with my third grade teacher. She would call me Bob, I would answer. And so, you know, that kind of resolved the conflict, and that's, you know, you come to resolution. When you write a memoir, you have these pieces where you have the, the beginning, the, the, the conflict, and then the resolution. Um, when I first started writing the memoir, people said, find a memoir that fits what you want to write about and, and then just do what they did. And so I started looking for memoirs. One, one memoir, you, you, you do not have to write your own memoir. Actually, somebody can, you can write a memoir for somebody else or uh, somebody can write your memoir. And the classic example that I, I thought about is uh, the book Beauty Before Comfort. Okay, this is set in Newell, West Virginia, and this woman, Mrs. Thornberry, was a friend of my, uh, was the, what, the mother of one of my friends, who my friend dated her daughter, and so I knew her very well. And her, her granddaughter wrote her memoir, and people in, in Newell and Chester are still angry about this memoir. <laughs> but it was a lovely, it was, it was, I mean, and, and most of the stuff is true, particularly about her, it's not exaggerated, but many of the other things were. But anyway, so. West Virginia has a rich tradition of memoir, memoir writing. Uh, so I started to read some West Virginia memoirs. Uh, one of the first that I read, one of my favorites ever, is Colored People by Henry Louis Gates, Jr. Okay. Gates wrote about growing up in, I guess, north central, northeastern West Virginia in the 1960s. And he was an African American. And he wrote about, I, I love the book because his descriptions of small town West Virginia were, were excellent, and I really could relate to that. And you know, the, the way that he, he talked about the people in the town of the town, I just I really felt close to, to what he talked about. Um, and so I love this memoir. And then you know, people said, "Well, you read that memoir, but you're you know you're not black." Well, no, obviously I'm not. Although I am in the West Virginia All Black Schools Hall of Fame. That's another story. <laughs> so um, the Gates book, though, was was excellent. But he wrote about change in black West Virginia within the context of white West Virginia. And I, I was interested in writing about change, but I, you know, it just, I, I, I couldn't relate to it in the sense that change within change. And so it was helpful, the things that he did, but, but I couldn't follow his pattern. Uh, uh, Rocket Boys, of course. You know, uh, Homer Hickam <clears throat> wrote a wonderful book about coal camp West Virginia, Coldwood, West Virginia, which was a coal camp. And he wrote about you know, the town, just a beautiful description of people in the town, the characters, and then going to the science fair and winning the National Science Fair Championship. And we've all seen the movie Rocket or October Skies. Okay. The Hickam book was a good model, but he write, writes mostly dialogue. I mean, his story is people talking to each other. Okay. I can't write dialogue. If I write dialogue, it's like me talking to me. You know, it's like it's like it, it's all the same. And so, while the book was good. 
it really wasn't going to help me much in terms of how to write my, my memoir. So, the Jeanette, Jeanette Walls, the glass cast. Okay, so, I love this book. You know, she starts in, in I think, New Mexico, and then the family comes to Welch, West Virginia. Uh, <clears throat> her father becomes the, the town drunk, takes that job. Actually, she can't hold a job because of the town drunk. The mom is an art teacher who, in the end, doesn't want to teach art anymore. The family is probably less than welfare. Uh, it, it's unbelievably dysfunctional family. The book is like re, well, like watching a train wreck. You, know, you can't stop because they keep spiraling down into worse and worse situations until finally the mom and dad become homeless on the streets in New York. And I thought, oh, if only my family were more dysfunctional, <laughs> I'd have written a lot better book. So, the, the book that really helped me probably the most was Doris Kearns Goodwin, Wait Till Next Year. Okay, Doris Kearns Goodwin is a, a presidential historian. She wrote the LBJ book that was a, a wonderful book. Uh, she did a Lincoln biography that I think was her most recent book. She's always on MSNBC when they talk about the president. So th this is her. She grew up at the exact, she's the exact same age I am. Uh, she grew up in Long Island during the same period I was growing up. And she was a historian. So I thought, ah, this is going to really help me. What really helped when I read this book was the Sputnik incident. She said, Sputnik 1957, she said Sputnik went over, you know, it was an earth-shaking experience. She said, so, my boyfriend and I wanted to watch Sputnik go over in the sky. And so we took a blanket out into our backyard and we laid down to watch Sputnik. She said, we got involved in other things and we didn't get to see Sputnik go over. <laughs> what she was telling me was that it's not, you don't write, if you're writing a memoir, you don't write about what happened worldwide. You wrote about how you saw it. It's your book. It's your story. And so that's what you do when you write a memoir. So I tried to, I, I took things from all these books, but the, the Doris Kearns Goodwin, the Sputnik incident, really was, was a telling kind of thing. Although I am a slow learner, and sometimes it takes me a while to teach me these kind of things, but that was very helpful. Uh, my book is set in Newell, West Virginia. Uh, a small, and it was set in the 1950s, when small towns were all very different and unique, when you went to Chester, which was a one mile away, and they did things, they were strange. They did things very differently than we did in Newell. You know, they, you know, they, they drank milk from a different dairy, and they, they, the, way, the games that they played were different, and the rules they had in school were all different, and the things that they thought were important were just different. And every town was like this. When you went to Fallensby, or you went to Weirton, or to Wheeling, they were all, they were different. And each town had, had its own rhythm of life. But World War II changed that. World War II planted the seeds of change. The kind of things that were developed technologically and the kind of thing, organizational patterns that they developed in the war really planted seeds that, that came to fruition in the 1950s. The first one was television. You know, the technological changes that they did in, during the war really created the viability of commercial television in the late 1940s. In 1948, television pretty much started. By 1960, television had permeated the country. 90% of the homes in the United States had television. And so this was a huge revolution that came very, very quickly. People quit sitting on their front porches in the, on warm summer nights. They stayed inside and watched television. People quit going to high school basketball games because they stayed home to watch I Love Lucy. People, people quit going to bars and drinking beer in bars. Sale, the sale of beer in bars went way down because people drank beer at home You know when they watched uh, other TV programs. Oh, incidentally, there's no free beer. <laughs> that was a mistake. Uh, so, or maybe I can have no, no, no free beer. Uh, so this was, you know, this was a huge change in life in America, and you know, and it, it also created a window on the world where you you could hear radio programs and imagine, but in television you could actually see what people's living rooms looked like and how other people lived. Uh, Secondly, supermarkets. In East Liverpool, in the mid-1950s, they developed an AMP, a sparkle market, and a thoroughfare. 
We had nine corner grocery store, stores in Newell in the early 50s. By the end, we had three. Instead of going to the corner grocery every day, you went to the supermarket once a week. So this, this distribution of, and, and selling of goods in one big central place really began to develop. You know, obviously, this led to Walmart. You know, led to malls. You know, this, this whole kind of centralization and distribution, which kind of came out of the war. Uh, the third one is there was a decline in, in, in mills and factories. And we were getting competition from the Japanese and from the Germans and from you know, the, the post-World War II kind of competition. And so you could no longer go back to your hometown and get a job in the mill, be guaranteed a job in the mill, and work there the rest of your life like your grandfather and your father did. This was changing. Uh, plus, highways were, were developing. You know, Eisenhower had been to Germany, he'd seen the Autobahn, and he realized that we needed that for national defense. And so he conceived of the interstate highway system, which they began to develop in the 50s. But even before that, you had the Pennsylvania Turnpike, the Ohio Turnpike, the Indian Turnpike, which were precursors to what was going to happen with the interstate highway system. So, and even, you know, across the, the river, they built the road from East Liverpool to Wellsville, it was a four lane highway. That was a big time. Uh, so it was easier to get places you could, in your car. It was a lot more convenient. So you could get out into the world. So all these changes were percolating in the 1950s. Okay, the book, I, and I wanted in the book to capture the traditions of small town, but also I wanted to capture that time of change and how small towns related to that change. And so that's what I, I tried to do in my, in my memoir. Uh, my family, was very Appalachian. And you know, people picture Appalachian as people living on small hillside subsistence farms. No, no, no. No, Appalachia is is a, a bigger variety of people than that. My family, my mom and dad were born in Ballinsby, West Virginia, which is a small steel mill town in the northern panhandle of the state. Newell, when you look at West Virginia, it goes this way. When you look at West Virginia, Newell was at the very, very top of the panhandle. Very, as far as you can go north. In fact, we argue with Chester about which is the most northern city in the state. Uh, unfortunately, no one's not incorporated, and Chester's incorporated, so they usually win. But, uh, the uh, Fallensby is located between Weirton and Wheeling, and it's a small steel town. My parents were born there, they grew up there, they went to high school there. My dad was one of, of ten brothers and sisters, and almost all of their family stayed in the Fallensby area. My mom's family was in that area. So this was this was their home place. You know, I mean, they, they my, my grandpa worked in the steel mill. My other grandfather was a, a dispatcher for the uh, trolley car system. And they, you know, they were Fallensby people. You know, they had friends there, lifelong friends. Uh, There's a lot of partying and gambling and drinking and going to football games, and they loved that. In 1951, my dad was transferred in his job to, from Steubenville, East Liverpool, Ohio, we settled in Newell, West Virginia. This was a foreign country. It was only 25 miles up the Ohio River, but it was like a strange place. We knew nobody there. We, we had no friends, we had no family. It was like we'd been ripped from our, from our home place and exiled into this foreign place, this foreign land. It was, it was bizarre and strange. But, and actually, it, it was, it wasn't a very attractive place either. Uh, in the book I read, don't get the idea that Newell was one of those picturesque villages with green lawns and white picket fences. It wasn't like that in the 50s, never had been. The streets were tar and gravel and filled with potholes winter and summer. Most of the town didn't have sidewalks. We walked on dirt paths with plenty of mud puddles. Newell was an unincorporated pottery town dominated by the Homer Laughlin China Company. The pottery industry was notoriously low paying and used a large number of unskilled and semi-skilled workers. Even though Homer Lachman was an industry leader in both ceramic technology and China design, it was never a high profit or high wage industry like the steel mills. And potteries were soon to face serious competition from foreign imports. But we kids thought we lived in the greatest town in the world. We felt sorry for children who had to grow up in cities like New York, Pittsburgh, or even Weirton and Fallensby. We had woods, Two nice playgrounds for our most treasured resource, the town dump. 
Most towns hid their dumps in out of the way places, but not in all. We were proud of our dump, which was located on the main drag, Washington Street. In fact, the dump was located across the street from Newell High School and from the football and baseball fields. The contents of the dump were not run-of-the-mill, were not run-of-the-mill type garbage, but refuse unique to Newell. The Hoover Hoffman China Company used the valley to discard the waste products from pottery production. The dump was not offensive, it didn't smell, except for acrid smoke from an occasional fire. Actually, the long, like, the long white wall of dishes cascading into the valley was kind of pretty and would have been considered a wonder if it had been located anywhere else, say, Dover, England. <laughs> Beauty aside, the dump was wonderful for the endless number of recreational activities it could sustain, ranging from mountain climbing, art, big game hunting, to dish breaking and plate sailing. So, what, what we did in our dump was uh, mountain climbing. So, the wall of dishes was like, the, the dump was located in a flat part of the town, and then they dumped the dishes down into a valley, a creek valley. And so, uh, by the time we got there, the, the pile of dishes was like 30 foot high. And so you could climb up these. They were a little slick to the touch, and they weren't you know, vertical, but it was a challenge. It was a little bit of mountain climbing, you know, a precursor to you know, people to do climbing today in gyms. I mean, it was free for us. Uh, uh, art. A lot of the dishes, and most of the dishes were discarded in the process before they were glazed, so they were rough china. So you could take the dishes and you could color on them with crayons. My, my sister, who was eight years younger than I am, uh, would, would go during Christmas or my parents' birthdays and get dishes from the dump and color on them and give them to my parents for Christmas presents. Also, she was the only little girl, I think, in the United States that had a full set of adult dishes, adult-sized dishes, that she had tea parties with her, with her dolls with on. So, art was big. Uh, uh, big game shooting. Some people shot rats at the river end of the dump, but I, I was never allowed to do that. Uh, dish breaking was very therapeutic. Other teens would hang out in their rooms you know, suffering from teen angst. But not in Newell. We went to the pottery and broke dishes, or to the dump and broke dishes. You know, an endless pile of dishes. You know, you could you could drop them and break them. You could set them up shooting gallery style and throw other dishes at them. You could throw them up in the air and throw cups at them. There were just endless opportunities to break dishes, and it <laughs> felt so good to do that. But to me, the most fun thing to do was to do to do dish sailing. So, dish sailing. You would throw the dishes out over the edge of the dump. Now, when you took the meat platters, the meat platters, you turn them upside down, and obviously you can't throw these frisbee style because you know, they're too heavy. So you had to throw them like sidearm baseball style. But the meat platters were so heavy that they were two handed. So you you'd kind of throw them up over the edge, and they'd wobble in the air, kind of funny. They would hit the pile of dishes and cause an avalanche. So that was kind of funny. The, uh, the, the plates, the dinner sized plates, weren't bad to sail. You, they weren't quite as heavy, and you could sail them out sort of over the edge, and uh, you, 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 you know, kind of get them flying a little bit. The best ones were the uh, salad size plates, because they were light enough, you could get them sailing pretty well. And if you keep them level, and they would catch the air coming out from the valley below, they could sail like over the end of the pile of dishes, to the creek, and maybe even to the hillside on the other side. But this was, this was really fun to do. One of the best dish sailors ever, a legendary dish sailor in the Denny Wells, who spent hours saving dishes and perfecting his technique. He quit the baseball team so he could sail dishes, uh, particularly at the end of his junior year when he went to the dump and spent hours there before he married his girlfriend and went off to join the Marines. But anyway, uh, this, this was, was a, a multi-generational, multifaceted recreational facility that no other towns had. We were so lucky to have the dump. Uh, the, when, when we were growing up, we were never taught anything about the early history of Newell in either West Virginia history or uh, American history, and it probably was better because when I, when, I, um, when I worked with this book, I found out that it probably wasn't a very pretty early history. We were taught nothing about the early history of Newell in either American or West Virginia history classes. Perhaps that was for the best because 
The earliest settlers in Lowell were murderers and warmongers. In 1770, Daniel Greathouse, an Indian scout, settled his family in what is now Lowell and built a blockhouse for protection from Native Americans. In April 1774, Greathouse, Samuel Munchmore, and a couple of other settlers enticed seven Native Americans, five men, a woman, and a child, who were camped south of Newell on the opposite side of the Ohio River near Yellow Creek to cross the river. The settlers gave the Native Americans rum until three of them were so drunk they passed out. The settlers engaged the other two in a shooting contest, and after the Native Americans emptied their guns, the settlers shot them dead. They shot the woman and when she attempted to run, and then cruelly butchered the three sleeping Native Americans with a tomahawk. The baby was spared because the mother had convinced the whites that the baby was the baby of a white man. This unprovoked and unspeakable cruel murder of Native Americans became known as Logan's Massacre because three of the murdered Native Americans were the father, brother, and sister of Logan, the great chief of the Mingo tribe, who had heretofore been the strong advocate of peace with the white settlers. The murder started Lord Dunmore's war and 10 years of brutal warfare that cost the lives of more than 40 settlers and as many Native Americans. The, 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 so the history of Louisville becomes better. In 1904, the Hummer Pottery, the Hummer Lachlan China Company, wanted to expand their plant in East Liverpool, but there was no more land in East Liverpool, Ohio. So they looked across the river and they saw this flat shelf of land, high enough up from the Ohio River that wouldn't flood, but yet big enough, at least a half a mile wide and more than a mile long, where they could build their plant. And so they formed a consortium uh, with a couple other potteries, and they began to develop Newell. The first thing that they developed was the Newell Bridge in 1905. 1905. The Newell Bridge is a toll bridge across the Ohio River from East Liverpool to Newell, which is still there today. And in fact, the Newell Bridge is, I think, the only toll bridge on the Ohio River it's privately owned. Uh, they immediately began to build the pottery uh, crossing the bridge, and by 1907, the pottery was completed. They really needed to get labor. They needed to have, have people come to work there. And so people did come across the Newell Bridge on the trolley, which they charged the workers in Nickel to come over and in Nickel to go back home. But people came from East Liverpool. But they needed, as the plant began to grow, they needed more and more labor. And so they began to try to attract foreign labor. One of the ways that companies at that time tried to attract foreign labor was to go over to Europe. And the Globe Brick Company, which was located just south of Newell, needed people to dig clay. They needed clay miners. The Globe Brick owner, Colonel Porter, went to Poland, where he knew that there were, there were brick there were clay miners, and brought clay miners from Poland to Newell, West Virginia, some of whom obviously made money and went home, but some of them stayed in Newell. And so this, there were a, a whole colony of Polish workers, the Franz Sykes, uh, the Eustachs, the Durgas, and the uh, Gibbeses, all grandfathers had come from Poland to dig clay for the, for the, uh, for the brickyard. Uh, what the pottery did was, that they advertised at Ellis Island. And so, and obviously they made Newell sound like a wonderful place. Uh, in the book, I wrote, the North American Manufacturing Company, okay, they, they wrote on one of the ads, why live in a dark, hampered, stuffy, noisy street when you can locate in a blithesome, cheery, sunny spot? Uh, asked one overblown advertisement. The ad then described Newell in glowing terms as the answer, Newell, affords fresh air, pure filtered water, an ideal home, the ad stated. It concluded with, in your wildest stretch of the imagination, you cannot conceive of a more beautiful spot. You've never been presented with such an unexpected opportunity. So, you think, so did the ad do any good? Yeah, yeah, they sucked in the Lenny family. The Lenny family originally lived in the region of Calabria, the rural province of Castenza, in the most southern part of Italy, near the, the foot of the boot. Because of the difficulty of making a living in the rugged terrain and the lawlessness of the Italian mafia in Calabria, the Lenise decided to emigrate to the United States in the early 1900s. The two oldest sisters and the oldest brother traveled to the United States in 1904 and worked in New York. The, the, the three sent money back to Italy to pay for the passage 
uh, for the six brothers and the parents to come to the new country. This process took 10 years. During that time, the family decided when everyone was in the United States, they would migrate to New West Virginia. They'd been attracted by the advertisements posted around the Ellis Island Terminal describing the wonders of living and working in Newell. When the youngest children, Carmen and Ralph, arrived with their parents, the older siblings told them of their decision to move to Newell to take jobs that had been promised them. The family traveled by train to Newell in 1914 and was very pleased with the rural, hilly terrain that reminded them of their native Calabria. On their arrival, seven brothers were hired to work at the Humber Lachlan China Company, and they all worked there the rest of their lives. The, in 1950, when we moved to Newell, there were 50 people in Newell named Laneve. They were like 2.5% of the Newell population. So that was, that, that was the, the biggest thing. I thought Laneve was like a common name in Italy. And you came to find out, no, it's just a common name in Newell. Um, <clears throat> other workers came from like the hill farms in Appalachia. Uh, some of my friends, came, friend, friends' parents came from like Middleborn, uh, where they worked on the farm, or uh, Pennsboro. And, you know, this is part of the, the beginning of the out migration in West Virginia, where they migrated from rural internal farms into the industries along the fringes of the state. Uh, Homer Lachlan became the biggest potter in the world in 1930, and they developed Fiesta Ware, which these are examples of Fiesta Ware, which are Art Deco. Uh, and they're very colorful, striking, striking pieces of pottery. Uh, they sell them in almost every store in, in every department store in the United States. Uh, if you go, and is it Kaufman still here? Yes. It's Macy's now? Okay. If you go to any Macy's, uh, you know, they have a display of Fiesta. We were in, I was in Sarasota, Florida, and we walked into the Macy's homeware department, and there was Fiesta wear. And of course, I told the guy, you know, I, I lived in that town and actually worked there. And he went, oh, good. You know. <laughs> so, by 1950, uh, you know, they, they, were, they were no longer hiring high school boys to come to the pottery and work in the summer. Up to that point, you could always get a job at the pottery in the summer or we were in steel. But by 1950, that, that was ending. So you, know, you had to work at the racetrack or somewhere else like that. But in 1961, the pottery hired two boys to work in the summer, two high school boys, actually were graduates. One was Mr. Basketball in Ohio, Kenny Cunningham, who was pretty famous in our area. The other one was me. And I got hired because I befriended the son of the human resources director and picked him to be on my baseball team and mentored him through a year <laughs> of, of youth baseball. And so in thanks, they hired me to work in the pottery for the summer. My job was wear boy. So, the first day, the, the foreman comes and says, do you know where? And I said, no, where? And he said, no, 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 do you know where? And I said, no, where? He meant, did I know where, W-A-R-E, meaning pottery. And I thought he meant, did I know where, W-H-E-R-E. -E. So, we did this for a couple minutes. I thought I was in a bad Abbott Costello skit. <laughs> do you know where? No, where? And finally he concluded, I did not know where, W-A-R-E, probably did not know where, W-H-E-R-E either. <laughs> but since I was hired, they were going to work with me. And so when he would want me to bring a truck of dishes or a bin of dishes, he would say, bring the little ones with the circles in them. Or bring the cups with the funny handles, which must have been very demeaning for this powerful industrial guy, an industrial giant uh, foreman to have to refer to the fine china they were making in such elementary school terms. But he did that to make sure that the wheels of production continued to grind. So, and I did make it through the summer without being fired, but it was, it was pretty close in time. Uh, television was the biggest agent of change during the 50s, I think. And so I wanted to write a chapter on television and movies and change. And so I went to the library and pulled out three or four histories of television and did a nice summary of the history of television. And so I showed it to my daughter, Megan, who said, I've read this history of television in five or six other books. I thought, oh, I'm on the right track. And she said, no, no, no. What you need to write is not the history of television, but how television impacted your family. You said you left television on all the time. You never turned it off. So what did you watch? You know, what, what, what kind of things did you say to each other around the TV? And so. You know, the Doris Kearns Goodwin hit me. Ah, oh, 
No, it's how television affected me, how television affected my family, and how television affected the town. So I started with buying our first TV. Uh, can any of you remember the first TV you had? Uh, okay, we're old people. We're old people. I, I did a talk at a, at a conference and asked, and asked people you know, if they could remember the first TV, and they were all young, and they, no. I said, can you remember your first color TV? No, it's always been there. But anyway, so the first TV, you have, to, you, have to, you have to have known my dad. My dad thought he was smarter than everybody in the world. And so when decisions were made, if everybody did something one way, my dad believed he could figure out a better way because he was smarter than they were. And so we spent our lives looking for specials and deals that he would find for us. Uh, I, I spent all my life riding a Colson bicycle with funny handlebars that hurt my back, but he got a deal on it. I and mean, this was really a good deal. So, you know, and what my dad didn't understand was that most decisions are really pretty easy to make. You know, and, and if most people do it, it's pretty much the right thing to do. There's only a couple decisions in life that really take any intelligence to really to, 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 to make. But my dad didn't understand that. He outfought himself at almost every turn. And he would always outsmart himself and do something stupid because he wanted to be smarter. So, and, and the TV was a classic example. We bought a Stuart and Warner TV. Everybody else was buying Philco, Westinghouse, Dumont, uh, GE. We, I swear, we were the only people in Newell with a Stuart and Warner TV. And they, I said, Dad, why did we buy the Stuart and Warner TV? And Dad said, well, Stuart and Warner makes the tubes that go in almost all the other TVs. Unfortunately, they made good tubes, but they couldn't put them together into a TV set. <laughs> the Stuart and Warner spent more time in the repair shop than it did in our front room. But that was, it wasn't a complete disaster because my Aunt Jim and Uncle, my Uncle Jim and Aunt Bess gave us a portable TV a metal portable TV that we could watch while the Stuart Warner was frequently in the shop. The portable TV was one that was a 17 inch, it was fine, except that the sound would go out periodically. And so, you know, and like Boston Blackie, who was a, a TV detective in the early 50s, who would always carefully explain how he, how he put the clues together and captured the criminals, would be talking, and like near the end of his discussion, his lips would move and the sound would go off. So. To get the sound back up, you have to give the TV a thump on the top, and the sound would come back up. And so, about every half an hour, the sound would go off, and we would take turns. And so, you know, we would go and thump the TV, and the sound would come back on. Sometimes, maybe it'd take two thumps. Dad would say, a little more to the back, Bob. Okay. And the sound would come up. Well, the TV became addicted to being thumped. And as you know, like with most addicts, you want more and more thumping. And so it reached the point that the TV needed to be thumped like every 10 minutes until that fateful day when somebody stepped up, the sound was off, and thumped the TV, and the picture went off too. Uh -huh. There was no amount of thumping or turning the TV set off and on or changing the channels would cause the TV to come back. And so we took the TV to the repair store in East Liverpool and the, the repairman put on the table beside the store in Warner that pretty much, they were getting ready to charge us rent for leaving it there so long. Uh, and they opened the back of the TV and the, the repairman just looked down and went. So we took the TV and gave it a decent burial over the edge of the dump. So, uh, football was a major event in Northern West Virginia. I mean, we were talking about traditions in sports and football is a tradition in northern West Virginia. It was, a, it was a puberty rite where you could prove your manhood by playing on the football team. But for the sons of the Polish, the Italian, and, and the Greek, particularly steel workers, this was, it was important because it demonstrated that you had the ability to, you know, even though you were an immigrant child, you had the ability to function in American society, and if you play on the football team, you'd learn American games and customs and would be successful in life. So it was very important to, to be a football player in northern West Virginia. Uh, and of course I played football because I love football. Uh, the, the most memorable game for me was my sophomore year when we played Weird Madonna. 
And I, we talked a little bit about football at the beginning. I was like a five foot three, 110 pound end. But that aside, we're playing weird in Madonna. So weird's the Madonna's the Catholic school in weird. And we were yelling things like, beat Madonna, kill Madonna. Like, Wait, Madonna's mother of God, what are we saying? <laughs> then the thing was, you know, we prayed in school every day because we had morning devotions, and that's when you did the Lord's Prayer and the, you know, the Pledge of Allegiance. And, you know, everybody did that. Even though you might mumble the prayer sometimes, you, you did the Lord's Prayer. And we thought, huh, weird Madonna is a Catholic school. They must pray all the time. They must pray, like, you know, all during the school day. So if the game is going to be close, is God going to take their son? Like, you know, is he going to intercept passes for them and maybe, you know, cause us to fumble the ball? You know, this, is, this was, was pretty tense. But we really need to have worried about that because the opening kickoff was the turning point of the game. We kicked off to them. They ran it back for a touchdown. They proceeded to run through us like the proverbial hot knife through butter. I mean, they just pounded us to death. By the third quarter, the score was like in the 40s to nothing. If you've ever been to the football field in Weirton, the football field in Weirton sits on a shelf of land over top of the steel mill. The steel mill is down in the bottom of the valley, the football field's on the first shelf of land. So we're in the third quarter. It's, it's the first game of the season. It's hot and humid. The, there's an air inversion, and the smoke from the steel mill is coming over the field. We look down into the open hearth furnace, and there's flames shooting up. And you know, we're imagining sparks are coming onto the field. The third quarter is endless. It's going on and on and on. It's like the clock has stopped. You know, we realized at that point that we were young men, and we looked into the face of hell. <laughs> this was what hell would be, playing weird and Madonna and getting pounded in the pipe. We vowed we would do better. We would be better people. But it didn't last long. They ended up maybe 60 to nothing. Um, the other thing that was really important in growing up in North West Virginia were dances. Okay, we, I wrote four chapters on sports, two on dances, one called Love, Sex, and Dances, and the other one was The Prom. And they're like one on school and one on work. So you can tell what what I thought was the most important things to be doing. So, the love, sex, and dances, I asked one of my friends one time when I was an adult, you know, we were both teaching at Marshall, and I said, Corey, do you and Grace ever go to dances anymore? You ever go out and dance? And Corey said, what? What? He said, dancing is a mating ritual. He said, the day I got married, I never danced after that. I went, ah. Oh. It was as if a veil had been lifted from my eyes. Dancing was a mating ritual. And, and immediately after dances, I wanted to mate with the girls I'd been dancing with. <laughs> Unfortunately, their concept of mating ritual was different than mine, and there wasn't any mating going on, but it was, it was still the ritual. So I asked my wife, Liz, who grew up in Chester, it was a mixed marriage, they were our hated and feared rivals, Chester. <laughs> uh, I said, Liz, why were there so many dances in New and Chester? And we had a dance every season in the high school. We had Sadie Hawkins dance in the fall, the Christmas dance, the Valentine's dance, the prom, the band dance. Uh, we had a dance after every football game, home football game, and every home basketball game. I said, Liz, why do you have so many dances? And she said, it's because girls found their husbands in high school. And the women teachers wanted to push that along and help them out by holding a lot of dances. I went, oh. So, but my favorite dances were high team. The high team was a dance held in Chester, West Virginia, in the second floor, the little gym on the second floor of the city hall. It was over top of the mayor's office, the jail, and the, the fire station. And so every Wednesday and Saturday night in the summer, and every uh, Saturday night during the school year, they had high team dance at Chester. Uh, The high team dances followed the same pattern each week. The gym floor became a dance floor when the lights were turned low. We became shadowy figures, somewhat mysterious, and immediately more attractive because the dim light hid pimples, bad haircuts, and other imperfections that haunt teenagers in the light. The smell also had an erotic quality. All girls wore perfume that often conflicted with the extreme amount of hairspray used to keep their 50s hairstyle in place. Sometimes boys got stuck in girls' hair and they slow danced. 
So the, and the boys wore way too much after shave lotion. Aqua Velva and Old Spice were the most popular, even though a few of us shaved more than once a month. Strangely, the heavy smells blended with adolescent sweat, only superficially covered up by mum and air and deodorant to form an erotic, musky smell. The smell was so pungent that we could hear male dogs howling for blocks around when the gym door was open. <laughs> to me, the most memorable dance was the Christmas dance my senior year. The Christmas dance my senior year was memorable because I took Pam Rockwell from Chester, who currently now lives in Charleston. Uh, you know, and, and that is her name. You know, I didn't use false names uh, because I told the truth. So. Uh, Pam from Chester, who I, I was dating at the time. Pam was short and a little chubby. The guys teased me when they found out I was dating her. Jake Gear was particularly cutting when he said, Pam is not a dish, she's more like the whole bowl. <laughs> I began to wonder if I should continue with her, but then remembered she was actually very cute and had a great sense of humor. We were convulsed with laughter in most of the time we were on our dates. I had to be careful drinking Coca-Cola when I was with her because she often made me laugh so hard that Coke came out my nose. <laughs> when I picked her up for the, the night of the Christmas dance, she was wearing high heels, which made her look immediately taller and more graceful. And as my eyes ran up her clinging dress, I realized she looked voluptuous. Her waist was thin, her breasts were large, the term hourglass figure fit her perfectly. I was speechless. Ronnie Moffat, who was double dating with us and much more articulate, could not suppress a wow when I helped Pam off with her coat. All through the dance, guys kept coming up to me to talk. Even guys I barely knew acted as if we were long lost friends. Some of them angled for an introduction to Pam. Most of them, including Jake Gear, knew her already, but either didn't recognize her or just wanted to get a closer look. I'm not sure what magic formula brought about the change in Pam's appearance, but I suspect that it was some kind of a long line girdle with a push-up bra. It must have been painful for Pam to wear, or she may have used it only for special occasions because I never saw her in that outfit again. I guess I should have learned from that experience how superficial and fleeting physical attractiveness and a big chest were. But like most guys, I had to be taught that lesson over and over and over again. <laughs> My class of 1961 was much different than my parents. When my parents went to the war and came home, they were sent to exotic places like Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, Germany, England, uh, Hawaii, I mean, really to, to wonderful places. They could not wait to get back to the Ohio Valley and the small mill towns in the Ohio Valley. They couldn't wait to take jobs in the mill, to get married, to build a house, and have a family and live happily ever after to live the American dream. In 1961, my class could not wait to leave. We wanted to get out of there. We had seen the world through the window of television, and we'd been to exotic places and cars by ourselves. And so we knew that there was a, a world out there that we wanted to, to, to see and to explore. Some of us left for better places. Some of us left for worse places. Some of us left and then came back home. But for all of us, we look back to Noah's home. Because as Dorothy said in The Wizard of Oz, there's no place like home. Club 
in the, in the book. And one woman came up and said, my mom's picture's in your book. I want, I want a copy. She was in the woman's club picture. So, Who published it? Uh, Jesse Stewart Books. It's a, a regional Appalachian publisher in Ashland, Kentucky. They do know, eight or ten books a year. Hmm. They, were, they were wonderful to work with. And did you approach them yourself, or did you have any? No, I, I, I searched through, I went through about four or five different publishers, and <clears throat> they kept giving me some mixed feedback. <clears throat> you know, they liked the book. One of them said, I love your history chapter. And the geology, I thought it was James Mixner. You know, I'm writing history geology of the town. And when one guy said, I love that. Another publisher said, cut the history stuff. Huh. You know, yeah. but, but they said, it's a, it's a wonderful book. You know, we just, it just doesn't fit what we do. And so Jesse Stewart said, we do Appalachian books, and that's what this is. Yeah. I want to get back to your life. Uh, the book is uh, wonderful, and getting it published, but I'm not a writer. Huh. But I've just been finishing a magazine called The Good Old Days. I don't know if you've heard of that. Yeah. Huh? Wonderful magazine. So, and it, it, all of a sudden, it's all known. My children don't know anything about me, where I'm from, mm -hmm. but I know where my parents from, my grandparents. There's nothing passed down, written. And it's really a shame that it would be really nice. But I would like to take my kids, well, especially my grandkids, the great grandkids, and put them back in the 1950s for a while. Mm -hmm. You know, right now they're throwing away food because they don't like it. Yeah. Hey, when I was like in the 50s, I had a choice, either a youth or a star. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I like to take them back and see, you know, with pop belly shows and the fair scene manners. Uh, it was a rough life, but you know, it's a good life. Yeah. Because the people around me were the same way. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it was, well, I appreciate it. Still, I think they'll be able to do memoirs that can come out well. And, and you know, I, I learned that uh, the idea of putting characters into, into, into writing is just so important. And you know, the, the uh, book I'm writing on history of sports, I'm trying to get as many people in and unique characters in, into it as I can. Other questions? Thank All you right. again. Well, let's give them another. West Virginia related ones as well, so take a chance to look at those as well and stop and say hi and uh, we'll see you next time. Oh, yes, it is.